Who down to you, Zays fans and Pelicans fans, to the Hudak Professional Podcast. And if you end up attending this live or hearing this after the place airs, we did start a little early, but there's a reason for that. We started early because the Pelicans have their playoff game against the Lakers tonight, and I didn't want people to be interrupted by watching this or watching the Pels, vice versa. So I wanted to try to get this in early so y'all have time for the Pelicans game. Some of y'all might just now be getting off of work, but that's okay. We're talking about Saints news and a little bit of the Pelicans. Usually we don't have like Pelicans devoted episodes, but with it being the plan and they lost their chance to have that six seed, but that's okay. Hopefully they can win their play-in game, but you'll have the Lakers coming to New Orleans tonight, 6.30 p.m. If you're not there, be there. Better have the Smoothie King Center absolutely rocking. And uh, this is going to be a tough one for the Pels because they lost the season series three to one in this one. Pels seem to be doing really, really well until they got Brandon Ingram back. And then just, it seems from the coaching standpoint, just lost all knowledge of how to play that. And I do think that the Pelicans just don't match up super well against the Lakers, but we'll see how that goes. Like I said, we'll get this pod over and that way we can watch our Pels and root them on and hopefully don't have a disappointing end to what has been for the most part, I would say a good season. I don't think it's been a perfect season by any stretch of the imagination. But in terms of what we expect, I think the Pelicans for me, and again, everybody's allowed to have their take on this. For me, the Pelicans outperform my expectations for them, whereas the favored New Orleans Saints, well, they kind of hit expectations, right? Like I didn't feel like the Saints would be great. They probably could have been a little bit better, but I'm not super confident what they have. But on the flip side of that, I do feel like the Pelicans this year outperform what I expected. I mean, they should have won 50 games, but it's the most games they've won in, I don't know, like 2008. It's been well over a decade. So this is their opportunity to do well. We'll see. Obviously, it's the first time they've been in the playoffs in two years. Well, not even the playoffs. They got to do the play-in because technically the play-in don't count as the playoffs. So we'll see how it goes. But definitely rooting for the Pels. Want them to have success. And as far as the Saints go, definitely get some thoughts of what y'all think out there. I'm going to get some of the Houdats and some of our bird lovers out there. Shout out to Pedro, James Griffon, Mr. Jerry, Mark Jean Marie. And, and again, Mr. Jerry, it's always good to see you. I'm curious, since you're such a regular to all of the New Orleans sports pods, how many Pelicans pods do you attend and listen to? And are you devoted to the Pelicans as you are the Saints, or do you prefer New Orleans? Now, with this being a Saints channel, I'll be very surprised if everybody doesn't just drastically favor the Saints. But like I said, the Pelicans have actually given me reason to hope this year, whereas I can't say the same thing about the Saints last season or even this season. I'm not saying that I'm not excited about the draft because I am, but I would say that the expectations for New Orleans are pretty low, whereas I would say that for the Pels, definitely higher. I loved how hot CJ McCollum is ending the season. I hate the just the blowout loss to the Lakers, which was, you know, what, two days ago, hopefully they can rectify that. Losing 124 to 108 ain't good. And it's not like they were, you know, oh, man. It's not like they were the worst team. And it's not like they were away. They weren't over in Los Angeles. They were here and just got wrecked. I mean, gave up 40 in the second quarter and just never felt like they had a chance. And then finally in the in the fourth, turned it on a little bit. But, yeah, very curious to see how about he lands uh, good to see you. Gerald says, what up, Rev? Go Pels. We definitely want to say go Pels and also who out to the Saints. So as far as Saints news goes, obviously a lot of things are looking forward to the draft and looking up to the draft, which is getting pretty daggum close. I mean, we're, we're almost into draft time. So if you are a fan of the NFL draft, well, good news. You're about to have it. New Orleans is visiting a DT that we've actually talked about. They heavily attended his pro day. And that, of course, is Newton out of Illinois, who we've talked about a little bit. I don't necessarily know if I would pick this, if I was the Saints to pick this. We actually talked about this directly on the podcast because I feel like he's a natural three-tech. But I guess there's an argument to be had for simply having as many good pass rushers as possible and seeing them get a good eye on him here in the process is, well, like I said, it's interesting. Now, as you look at everything else they've had, like you look at the 30, uh, the top 30 visits that we know they've made, you don't see the same style of DT necessarily, but we do know that they've looked at uh, Christian Boyd. They've had him in. He's projected to be 
day three pick, we know that they have had uh, Marshawn Nealon, who's probably a day two pick, maybe day three pick they've had in. So we can actually kind of get an idea of what they're looking at in terms of interior players, stylistically maybe by comparing those different names. And I I'm very interested to see what they end up doing here. Clearly, they're putting a lot of thought into trying to find the best defensive line they can. I think they are acknowledging openly that they saw the same things that we talked about here on this show and other shows that the DT position needs to get upgraded. Now it should be pointed out that not everybody's the same style of player. For example, I just mentioned um, Boyd, right? That is a big monster. He's like 6'3", 330, nose tackle, right? So very different style than the Illinois DT, who to me just seems like a fantastic three-tech prospect. Not as excited about him as I was maybe Brian Brzee, but I mean, still in that same stratosphere where they're first-round talents, right? You see New Orleans trying to focus on that position. And I do think that Colin Saunders is a good player, but at the same time, Colin Saunders is a veteran, been in the league a while, and getting a young guy there, nothing wrong with that as a strategy, right? That doesn't mean that Colin Saunders needs to be pushed to the side, but with, with us talking about one text, you're usually talking about a day three pick. Colin Saunders turns 28 this year. He still probably got good years left in him. I think he had a really good year last year. I think he was underrated. I mean, he had 57 tackles, which for a nose tackle is really good. Seeing a defensive tackle get over 50 tackles is, you don't see a lot of that. I realize that having an extra game in the season helps those stats a little bit, but that's pretty daggum good, right? And that's coming off what I would say was a pretty solid season his last year in Kansas City. Now, he didn't bring in any sacks, but you don't typically expect one text to do that. Anyway, I would have liked to see him at least register in that column, but he did get a few good pressures in. I feel like he contributed in that department. But looking at a guy like Christian Boyd, certainly could be your future at that position. And then you also have uh, Michael Nealon, who probably going to fit more into the defensive end role, but I do think that he could have the ability to slide inside and operate as a three tech, maybe a little bit. I'm curious if chat has looked at him at all and has a similar uh, opinion. Wow, words are hard, and then we say them live on stream. But the reason I think that a lot of people might like him is pretty athletic. I think he had pretty good scores and everything, and then you look at what he can do as a pass rusher. I don't think he has the explosiveness to be like a dominant guy on the outside. 270, he could operate similar to how like a Tano Passignon does. The only other thing about him is he's very short. I mean, he's only six foot and doesn't have amazing length. He's got good length, 34 and a half inch arms. But maybe somebody who could be a smaller interior worker. Uh, you, you don't see a lot of guys who play three tech at 280, but NASCAR packages. Again, we're talking about day three picks, right? So that doesn't mean that you have to get that guy and he has to be ready to go and has to contribute immediately. We're, we're talking about a position and a draft position that's typically seen as developmental. So you don't expect, if those guys take, get taken the first round, then we're just going to be probably saying very negative things about the New Orleans Saints. You, you take either Christian Boyd or taking uh, Marshawn Nealon in the second or the third, you're probably pretty ticked. You get those fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, et cetera. You're probably really happy, right? You, you really like what that position is looking like. But it's still very interesting to me to see Johnny Newton or uh, I, I'm just a little bit confused isn't the right word. I understand always doing your homework on who could be the best player available. Because remember, I, I harp on that. You want to take best player available. No matter who it is, you want that. And when you're talking about, you know, Jerzon Newton or Johnny Newton here, man was a two-time All-American, 103 pressures in the past two years. Like, that's impressive. Pretty good athlete. And he had a broken foot last year he played through and still managed to get like eight sacks. I mean, that that's just really, really nice. That's just really nice. 6'2", 305, I mean, very prototype of your traditional anyway, three tech. So as we look at what that could provide for the team, the only question would be is, do you take him in the first when you've already taken Brian Brzee? And how does that defensive line look? And if you do take him, are you planning to run, just have one of those guys line up on the outside? Are you maybe looking at more odd fronts and, you know, maybe having him be a special role, you know, so you can get him snaps on the field. How do you end up looking at that? Because that would be a very curious first round pick. But if this is the type of guy that somehow falls to the second, maybe because of the medical uh, flag where you look at him having an injury last year, 
well, maybe you end up having a steal in the second, and you just take the guy who's the best potential player for your team. Again, very, very curious to see how New Orleans plays this because I feel like there aren't wrong answers, but there might be curious answers. You know, I, I don't feel like New Orleans is in a position where they have to be picky position-wise. Sure, they absolutely need offensive tackle. We spent last episode talking a lot about offensive tackle and who I would take and different injury concerns and maybe even leverage concerns given size and need of growth because I feel like there's a lot of good tackle talent in this draft but I don't feel like there's a lot of great elite tackle talent, like ready to go right now, blue chip tackle talent, right? I think that that's a position of need and pick, you know, picking that at pick 14 would be completely, you know, a legitimate pick where you're looking at left tackle, very unsure, right tackle, very unsure for the future of both of those sides. I think either of those would be a fine pick, but you know, you could also just say, Hey, if you got a guy that you believe can be elite, BPA is always a good choice, right? Now, I see somebody in the chat. Shout out to you. Mark says, who's your top five OTs in the draft that you'd love to see with the Saints? Uh, That's a tricky one because, one, are we talking left side, right side? I would say that I like Fuaga. I don't think that maybe he has the same upside as some of the other guys, but I do think that he's stout, ready to go now. I do like Fashanu. He needs a lot of work, but I do like him. I like Mims on the right side, but injury history is definitely something that you got to think about. I think Blake Fisher is a really good one that probably doesn't get as much talk as others, but again, needs to have development. But I think that's the case for all of these guys. I think there are a lot of really talented guys in the first round who simply need work, right? Simply need more work. I would say Blake Fisher doesn't have the level of athleticism that I would normally look for, but... He's your right tackle, not your left tackle. He is kind of similar to Ramchek in that way. He's athletic for the right side of the ball. And even though tackle is evolving as a position where it's becoming more neutral and not as specific between what you look for in the left right side because right side edge rushers and they're just as good as left side edge rushers in a lot of teams, you do want to see him be quicker out of his stance. I think that's one thing that I note. And you can even see that at his underwear Olympics in the combine. You know, his 10-yard split was like 1.8, which is not terrible, but it's not the fastest. And you want to see him, you know, work on that. The other side of that is he's got good length. I mean, he's got like 35-inch arms. He's 6'6". So he can keep guys off of him, but he's not like too tall like Joe Alt, who is over 6'9". And I, I just I see so many leverage issues with Alt. So there are a lot of options they can go for, depending on left side, right side. And with Trevor Penning being a question mark, but having potential to maybe work out, and then Ramchek being, when healthy, a a good player in the league. I don't think that he's at the elite level that he used to be, but he's a good player in the league. But has those injury concerns now. Either of those choices are very good choices. I think that if you're New Orleans, all this homework is great, but it does put a little bit more intrigue because I talked about the 30-day visits or the top 30 visits, and again, that can't, You can't just sit there and predict that, oh, guaranteed, they visited, they're getting drafted. That's absolutely not what I'm saying. But you don't see them putting that same level into OT that we've seen defensive line. And that brings me back to this being a defensive head coach team where you see them focusing on defensive linemen, not just this year, but in years past. Even though you have a head coach who is a secondary coach, They continue to try to throw a lot of effort in the defensive line, and I hope that doesn't come to the detriment of the offensive line. And again, I I don't think, and I'm curious if anybody in the chat agrees with this, I don't think that we can just take this and run with it because obviously they were at the Senior Bowl. There's offers of tackles there that they went in pretty heavy at, and we know that New Orleans loves drafting from the Senior Bowl. But you're talking about just top 30 visits and, and pro day workouts and things like that, especially the local pro days, You don't see them looking at the offensive side as much. And that could be all smoke and mirrors. The beauty of the draft is that nobody knows, right? I can sit here on this podcast and have training and guesses and watch other shows and get other people's opinions, but nobody knows. It doesn't matter if you love Mel Kuyper, hate Mel Kuyper. It doesn't matter if you like Colin Cowherd, hate Colin Cowherd. Everybody's just about equally proficient in guessing how teams are going to go. Now, you will find like really good draft gurus who maybe can get like ah, five to ten of the first round picks, right? Like they have their ear to the grindstone and, and they just kind of have an idea of what teams are going to go for. Who's their favorite. Usually the top five, top 10 are probably the easy ones, but every now and then you'll, you'll 
follow certain guys and gals who are really good at say, hey, they just know that this guy is probably going to pick 15 because this team just fell in love with him in this process and they believe that he's going to be there when the draft. And New Orleans is guilty of that. New Orleans has gone after their guys when maybe not necessarily anybody else is going to grab them at a certain draft pick because that was their guy. And they believed him. They believed that they were going to be able to grow them into what they needed to be successful. So I'm curious to see all the defensive line focus. And again, I don't see it as a negative. I simply see it as a byproduct of this team having probably a pretty steady decline, I would call it, while still not being bad. I do want to point out that I don't feel like New Orleans' defensive line last year was bad. And I don't feel like there's any metric that you can really argue that as a team, this defensive line was bad. They were still a top 10 team, but it's not as good as it was, especially in the pass rush department. That has started to fall. Getting 34 sacks in 17 games is not good, right? And that's no shade to Carl Granderson. Uh, I feel like Granderson has done a really good job to become a good to very good player to his side of the ball. Not shown anything elite yet, but still, you know, he, he's solid. He'll be 28 this year. But you even go back just a year previous, go back to 2022, and look what this team was doing. 48 sacks, so 14 more sacks. You go back to a year previously, 2021, and they were at 46 sacks. I mean, right around the same amount, and you've had turnover there. I mean, 2020, you had 44 sacks. So you saw a pretty steep decline and that's going to affect your secondary. It's going to affect your linebackers. All of that is going to end up mattering. Randy, good to see you. Love it. And does Kid says, please, underrated need on DT. Get the one tech. Well, Mr. Kitts, let me just go ahead and tell you. I love one techs. They're undervalued, underloved, underappreciated, not brought up enough. Now, I will say that I bring up one techs a lot because I'm real big on the trenches. I love that style of play. It's absolutely fantastic to me. And I will always be in love with trench warfare. So it doesn't matter if you get a one tech or a three tech or a five, you know, we're, we're running a, you know, a three alignment. If we're getting wide nines, I love defensive line play, just getting out in the face. And, and that goes for offensive line too. That's my favorite. I always harp on the trenches. I do feel like this team needs to address the trenches. I feel like that's probably the biggest need on this team is the trenches. I think safety is a need. I think long-term quarterback is a need, but the trenches have got to be built. And, I think good teams do that. You look at what the Cowboys have done for a long time. You look at what the Eagles have done for a long time. Good teams build their trenches, even before they build their quarterback, right? Like the Eagles have gone to multiple Super Bowls in the past decade with different quarterbacks all around. But what they've consistently done is build their trenches. Now, that doesn't mean that you can just simply replicate that and call it the perfect formula and everybody who starts doing that is going to be successful. But I will say that you've seen a consistent effort by Philly to get quality players on both sides of the trenches. And I'll give you examples. Last year, ninth overall pick, Jalen Carter. The year before that, I'm a, hell, I'll, I'll just do top 50 picks. I won't even do like throughout the draft. The year before that's when they got Jordan Davis. They also got Cam Jurgens in the uh, second round. Then you go the year before that's when they got Landon Dickerson in the second round. It's an offensive lineman. They also picked a third round defensive lineman that year. But still, go back to 2019, Andre Dillard. First round, offensive tackle. Go back to uh, two years before that. That's where they got Derek Barnett in the first round. Consistency. You see them continually looking to solidify that. Go back to 2013 when they drafted Lane Johnson, who one of the best tackles we've seen in the game. They put a lot of effort into their trenches, even when they already have good players, right? Like when they drafted Jalen Carter last year, we knew Jalen Carter is arguably a you know special talent, but they have and still do technically have good players in the interior of that team already. They didn't need Jalen Carter, but they saw, hey, build towards the future, right? Because you still have Fletcher Cox. Now, I will say Fletcher Cox at the end of his career. Fletcher Cox and Jalen Carter had the same number of sacks. I think Fletcher had five, right? You still build for the future, regardless. Fletcher was the starter. And that's a team that still has, a, you know, an aging Brandon Graham at the time. They had a young Josh Sweat. Right, they had um, Hassan Reddick that they had picked up. They brought in as part of their pass rush, so they're constantly addressing that, and that's something that New Orleans I think needs to replicate. But they need to replicate better because New Orleans has put draft picks in, but not gotten the same level of results. Even though you can't argue the Lakers, the Lakers still got the Pelicans game on brain. Still can't argue the Eagles have gotten perfect every time they've done it. Not every name I rattled off in their draft, you know, symposium right there, was an elite talent but they're still consistently hitting it. 
And again, I only hit the first two rounds because last year they drafted a third round offensive lineman in Tyler uh, Steen, who was on the roster for 11 games. Cam Jurgens, who I mentioned, has been 28 games. I mean, it's not two full seasons, but that's still pretty good. Landon Dickerson's 47 games in three years. That's big, right? You need to see New Orleans getting guys who contribute that amount. I mean, uh, even Jack Driscoll, who they brought in back in 2020, they got him in the fourth round. He's played over 50 games. So I think New Orleans has to really focus on improving that because, yes, you want to find your quarterback of the future. But I look at Carolina. It's a great example of maybe you found your quarterback of the future. Maybe you didn't. You didn't do him any favors with your offensive line. None at all. Doesn't mean I'm trying to just dump on him because I think there's way worse problems in Carolina than their offensive line. But you didn't do your quarterback any favors with the offensive line you gave him as a rookie. Sure, you didn't do the same thing with his ownership and how things were constantly being moved around on him with coaching. But you still have got to put that. And that's one thing I gave Houston a lot of credit for. Houston did do that. Like Houston did go out and build an offensive line. They went and got a premier left tackle years ago. Or what, the highest left tackle in the league right now, highest paid. Did his own contract, by the way. Shout out to him. But you look at who they brought in to actually start. They did a good job of addressing need. So they have Laramie Tunzel, but they also had Titus Howard, uh, Michael Dite, Shaq Mason, who they brought in. Uh, they've got George Fant on the right side. So they went and got guys to come in and contribute. You know, uh, Shaq Mason was a starter for New England for like eight years. You know, a George Fant's a veteran of the league for a long time now. He was with Seattle and New York, but they brought him in to be a starter, and he did a solid job as they tried to improve while bringing in a rookie quarterback. Something I think New Orleans has to look at long-term because at some point, New Orleans has to break this really weird history where they just don't draft quarterbacks in the first round. I guess in theory, they could go forever relying on, I mean, truly, I guess they could. They could go forever relying on free agency to find their quarterback, but I don't feel like that's a long-term solution. Curious if Chad agrees, but I don't feel... I feel like you've got to find a homegrown. And I feel like the best teams homegrown their quarterback. I look at the best quarterbacks in the league right now. Most of them were homegrown, right? Whether you're talking about Dak Prescott, Patrick Mahomes, even Jordan Love and Green Bay. I mean, generally it's not free agent pickups that are becoming the elite quarterbacks for teams. It's guys that you bring in who maybe sit a year behind an elite guy, like Jordan Love, who sat a couple years behind an elite guy. But it's not typically the bringing in the elite guy that works. And I know it worked with Drew Brees. And I'm not saying it can't work again. What I am saying is there are methods to where we have seen this blueprint works. And the blueprint that we know works with quarterbacks is high round draft picks, first rounders specifically, top into that first round even more so. Those are the ones that provide the most to your long-term chance of success at quarterback, more so than getting a free agent. I mean, a good example is Kirk Cousins. There's nothing wrong with Kirk Cousins. Very good quarterback. Solid, right? You can make an argument that he's better Derek Carr if you want to because we, we we're not happy with Derek Carr or Dennis Allen. But he's not elite, right? He, he never was elite, but he's been a starter for multiple teams. Got to start with a new team. But do you ever look at him and go, hey, he's going to lead this team to a Super Bowl? And I don't think many people are looking at him and saying that. If they are, more power to him. None of this is meant to be a trash talk. I simply think that New Orleans needs to focus on building their offensive line and then finding a quarterback that they can rely on long-term. I feel like that's more likely to come through the draft, whether it's this year, next year. I don't really know if there's anybody at pick 14 that they're going to find that gives them the long-term answer at quarterback. I know some people have different opinions of quarterback for this year's draft class. I personally am not super high on this year's class of quarterback. If you picked one up, I do think that there are plenty of guys who are talented enough to develop. Nobody really just stands out as an elite guy. A lot of people's favorite is Caleb Williams, who probably will go early and probably is maybe the best ready to start right now. But I also think that he has negatives, right? Uh, a big thing, I don't th- think he throws with great anticipation and timing. Touch is not really his thing. And, that's not something you, you've got to have that to be elite in the NFL, but you can develop those things, right? The, you don't need it all. I feel like he does do one thing very, very well. Dude feels pressure. Amazing. I don't feel like he's going to be 
I don't know if he's ever going to be a quarterback that takes like, you know, 40, 50 sacks in the season. He's going to find a way to get out. Very similar to how Russ would get out of a lot of plays early in his career. Still, though, I don't really know if any of those options are the option for New Orleans, and they're not really in a pick situation to get him anyway. They'd have to trade up a lot. Then you got guys like Jaden Daniels, who I know that we have people who love Jaden Daniels in the chat. I get it. LSU love. I do think he's a year one starter. Just don't feel like he matches this team at all. He's hyper athletic, right? And I do feel like he's a good quarterback, not a great quarterback. But I think that he has the intelligence and the ability to be better. And I'm definitely not trying to pull the whole like, oh, he should be a wide receiver thing. I simply think that when you look at his style, it just doesn't fit New Orleans. I feel like he definitely fits certain styles of quarterback play in the NFL, just not the West Coast Clint Kubiak system. It would take him time to be that. But I do think he could be elite. I mean, I, I think that he goes to a team, runs zone read, that lets, you know, takes advantage of how he does a pretty good job of pre-snap reading, in my opinion. I feel like he's another guy that does really well identifying defensive pressures that are coming. But I do feel like he will look for an, esca, uh, an exit. And when he looks for an exit, he takes his eye off receivers. And that's just something you saw. But I think he'll be a successful quarterback. It would just take a lot more for him to be successful under Clint Kubiak in New Orleans. But he could. I just don't really know if there's a lot of quarterback options. It's, it's kind of like the NBA draft for the Pelicans. Like, I feel like they've gotten a lot of good players. But do they all work well together? And some of that is coaching. Right, and I'm really curious to see how this game plays tonight. Obviously, it's about to tip off here at 6.30. Really looking forward to what ends up happening. Brandon Ingram came back, and it's weird. I feel like the team is either better with only Brandon Ingram or only Zion Williamson. Like You put both of them on the field, you get into this um, too many Chiefs issue where there's so many leaders on the field. Like Brandon Ingram wants to lead this team, and I think that he can lead a team. C.J. McCollum is a, is a veteran leader. Zion Williamson is a probably the most talented of the three. Wants to be the natural leader. And by the way, I have definitely cast a lot of my own doubt on Zion over the past couple of years. But the second half of the season, he really stepped it up defensively. And it was fantastic to see him be better at that part of the game. But you, you got to see them all work effectively. And it, it, when you saw... Just Zion and just CJ. And the three game was exploding. And obviously they do rely on needing guys like Trey Murphy to be on because some games he's off, some games he's on. He can be very hot and cold as a shooter. And when he's on, this man's shooting the ball from like 29 feet out and nailing it all net. No buckets, but net buckets. Great. It's KFC right there. Chicken, done, winning. Other times, it's brick after brick after brick. Just depends on how hot he is at the time. So... I feel like there is similar issues with both teams where they've got to find guys that fit what they're trying to build. I don't necessarily believe in the playoff winning ability of either head coach or either professional sports team in New Orleans, but at least you have a play-in shot here with the Pels. Still believe they should have had the sixth seed, and I won't, I won't leave that opinion. I'm, I am frustrated that they did so well because I think in a lot of other seasons you win 49 games, you probably are the sixth seed. But they had that four-game losing streak. And the big one for me was the Spurs game. Losing the Spurs, I mean, you can talk about losing to Orlando. Losing the Spurs game was huge for me. That, that was just such a killer. I, I can understand losing to the Suns in the streak. With the Suns, you're competing for the same spot. But losing the Spurs was just inexcusable, in my opinion. That, that, that really hurt them. And then also, maybe I'm in the wrong here, but... I don't think you should have lost to the Celtics either. Celtics are the best team in the East. Sure. Still feel like the Pels match up well against them. I really do. That that might just be putting very much a Pelican blinder on. But I feel like they match up pretty well against the Celtics. I feel like the Pelicans, if they had to go toe-to-toe with them in a seven-game series, that'd be a fun series to watch. Maybe I'm a little bit weird for having that opinion. But I feel like they can and do match up well. And I would love to see that happen. But anyway, we'll see. The tip-off is in, like, right now. So if y'all aren't already getting ready, make sure you get ready for your pals. That's why we started the show early. By the way, TJ, good to see you. I know it was kind of unannounced that we were starting the show early tonight, but 
I just, I had to, man. I, I've got to see the Pels. Can they make it into the playoffs? Such a big deal for me. I want to see them playing in the playoffs. But who that? Who that? I think they should go offensive attack on the first round. Charles Camo, I agree with you. Again, I hope that's a BPA choice, not a directed choice, though. I don't like the idea of New Orleans making a targeted pick. I feel like they need to make a pick that fits them. But yeah, I, I do feel like that would be something that I'd be happy about. I really do. I would be happy about that. I would be really happy about that. Now, because you said that, Charles, who's your guy? I say that because I feel like everybody has at this point picked their guy. Who is yours? Who is yours? And I do agree with you on the Pelicans note. I work hopping back and forth, but I am excited about the Pels. I do agree. I hope the refs allow them to play that game clean. Don't get in the way. Let them play it. Let them go after it. But I, I'll, I'll put it this way, man. I really need Pels fans to show up, get crazy, get loud, and, and really support this team. Because, man, if you lose to the Lakers in the play-in, oh, man, it's going to be a rough offseason. It is for me. I don't know how it's going to be for you. Now, Charles says, I like the guy from Penn State. Okay. Nothing wrong with that. For me, that's actually the one that I have kind of like circled as I'm optimistic about, but at the same time, mm, hesitant. I, there's a mixed bag there. He needs a lot of work. And I don't know enough to know if the Saints offensive line can be the one that make that a consistent thing. But I will say he's good. Big thing that he needs to work on, though, in a lot of ways, he's similar to Penning. I do think he's better than Penning coming out. But twist stunt game doesn't pick it up well. Shout out Trevor Penning. Same thing. Uh, loses the leverage battle a little bit too much because he can lean forward just like Joe Alt can. That's something that you want to worry about. His slide is not that great. Needs to get worked on. I do think that he can be a really good player. He has very similar issues to Penning coming out. And I, I don't know. I am been, I've been scarred by Trevor Penning. I have been scarred by Trevor Penning. I am being unjust and unfair to Fashanu because so many of the things that I watch about him, I go, dang, Penning has that problem and he never fixed it. He obviously could be very different. But, now, and I'll be honest, why, TJ? My, and you'll find this is not the majority opinion. My thing with Joe Alt simply comes down to I do not trust his ability to meet the elite pass rushers in this league with his size. I worry about him consistently losing the leverage battle. 34-inch arms is good. 6'9", scary tall. But he has a lot of flaws early on. He could be, truly, an all-pro level player. But this dude has the... And I talked about this same problem as Anders Pete early in his career. He is shoulders over hips a lot. You go watch his tape, you see this quite often. Now, there are some things that he does really well. Like he pulls really well, like he moves really well. I feel like he is good striking, right? I feel like he's much better at picking up the twist stunt game than Vashanu. But I feel like he can get wrecked by low pad level leverage players. And when you're 6'9", that's basically everybody across from you. And I feel like that's something that he's going to have to worry about because too often, a lot of his wins would just be he dominated by being 6'9", 330. And sure, that works in college. That's not going to work as often. He just doesn't have that, you know, he's not that Quentin Nelson. He's not the immediately come in and it's like, Dane, there's not really a lot of flaws here. He's still a first-round pick. He's still a first-round pick, but it's one of those that you've got to be aware that sometimes size can be a negative, right? It's the same thing with DTs. You look at Vita Vea. Vita Vea is an explosive, very, very good gap player. And as far as one tech goes, probably one of the best, if not the best, pass rushing one techs in the past decade. However, being a great one tech ain't the same as being a great three tech. Because you'll never confuse Vita Vea with Fletcher Cox or Aaron Donald. Sometimes size can be to your disadvantage. 
And that's one thing I worry about all is can he, will he allow people to get inside of him too much? He has to have great hand control. He has to have great uh, shot power, has to have great hand placement. And then he can, you know, manage that. But leverage is going to be your concern with Joe Alt. And guys that are 6'9 can have that struggle. And that's not even a Joe Alt thing. That's a history of the NFL thing. He's got the NFL pedigree. You know, he's coming from what was Pro Bowl dad. Yeah. Pro Bowl dad. His brother plays in the NFL, or I'm sorry, his brother played in the NHL as a hockey player. He got the pedigree. Athletic as heck. The fact that this, remember we were talking about athletic scores and I talked about one of the drawbacks to uh, one of the tackles that he ran a 1-8, 10-yard split. Joe Alt at 6-9 did a 1-7 split. Like, that's just nuts. Dude's ridiculously athletic for the size. Just worry about leverage. And leverage can cost you a lot of wins. Leverage can cost you a lot of wins. But I think that he can be elite. But I think this offensive tackle class is very much a everybody. There's like 10 guys that can all be really good. But I wouldn't say any of them are like elite. And I remember going through, I went to NFL.com because Lance Zerlon still does um, scouting reports and Chad Router, I think, and you know, a few different people for them. But I remember Lance Zerlon doesn't even have Joe Alt as his top guy. He's got uh, Latham, J.C. Latham out of Alabama. I think Latham is a safer player. Safer player. Now, different position, right tackle versus left tackle. But if you're New Orleans, you need both. I feel like you have a much safer, more reliable, consistent guy if you go after Latham. Probably a better player to start right now. But does he have the upside? No. You also have to argue he might need to lose some weight because that dude's 345 pounds and you worry about speed rushers dominate him. Ron Ramchek struggled with speed rushers early in his career. I mean, that's just reasons. But yeah, Ryan Ramchek's a big dude. Again, leverage is something you have to worry about. And Ramchek's only like 315 pounds. He's not 345. This is 30 pounds lighter. and He's 6'6". So all these things are things that I look at and I go, hey, Good traits, but at the same time, can't ignore size. And size is it's why they talk about height, weight, speed so much. It's, it's very basic, but at the same time, there's a lot of truth to it. And you can still have great traits. But you got to watch out of what those traits turn into, or can they translate in the same way that you see them translate in college? Charles says, not many people do, but I like the guy from Georgia. Well, I mean, I like Mims. My only thing with Mims is injuries. You worry about the injury history. Worry about the injury, injury history. But I like Mims. I think Mims operates well. I think he's you know athletic enough to be a end of first, second round type pick, maybe even a mid first if you just believe that he's fully healthy and he's not going to have any issues, which if I'm New Orleans, please don't do that. Don't play that game. New Orleans, please don't play that game. I, I, I don't have time for you to be playing that goof off game, New Orleans. Stick away from injury history, even though I like Mims. And if they picked him, I'm not going to trash talk him. But I'm still over here like, hey, I need a guy three years in college, no injuries. Let's go with that. That, That's my choice. But I like Mims. I think he's a good player. I think the only issue is just kind of like what I rattled off. You got to worry about those flags. And New Orleans just not had good luck with that. They they have not had success consistently finding guys to be healthy and stay healthy when they come to New Orleans. And that's a worry for me. Calvin says Latham has the highest floor, not so high ceiling. Yeah, I would agree. And now I would say that Latham also can have some fine tuning. I truly believe that if he lost 20 pounds and worked more on some of that athleticism with his technique, I think that he could be a Pro Bowl level player. But I do think that he's probably the most ready to go, which tends to happen a lot for Alabama players under Saban and everything. Saban finally gone. We'll see what that looks like long term. But that that team has a history of putting out guys who are ready for the NFL. They aren't necessarily elite but they are ready to go. And that's something that, you know, is worth mentioning. And there's value to that. And then what do you value more? Do you value the elite or do you value the good, but need it now? Like I need to have success RAT right now. So I'm going to go with this guy, safer pick. Maybe not the best pick, safer pick. Sometimes safe pick is not a bad option. Unless it's a quarterback. Never go ever. Never go safe pick on quarterback. We hate safe picks on quarterback. I do. If you don't, that's fine. I'm not hating you, but I hate safe picks on quarterback. 
Also, for those watching live, Pelicans and the Lakers are currently going off. Pelicans are winning 13 to 10. Very early. Can't do anything with that. But 13 to 10. But Pelicans have come out shooting pretty well. Ingram's got five points. Zion's got four. Valentinus four. To come out with their big, tall loadout, which you would expect with them having to go against guys like AD and LeBron. So you don't have the um, buckets from downtown group out there right now. But you do have the bigs. And they're going big to big. They're, they're trying to say, hey, we'll beat you at your game. We'll see. I really need guys like Herb. I need guys like Marshall. I need definitely guys like Trey Murphy. Hit their threes. Hit their threes. And this is a game, Pels, I need you to hit like 40% of your threes, man. Nail them. Nail them. Who that to you, Chambliss? Great to see you. And Calvin, you're all right. Mims has the least stars of any of these guys, which is why I feel like he very much could be a second-round pick. And you start seeing him slip to the second, maybe third. If you're in New Orleans, you got to go, hmm, that looks appealing. I feel like you got to say that looks appealing. It does to me, but that's pick value. First round pick, very different than third round pick. Pick value looks much more appealing. So. Oh, man. Oh, I'm excited for this game, but we're going to wrap it. I'm going to get my kids in bed and everything, and I'm going to see about these Pels games. Hopefully, y'all have enjoyed the stream. I know we started a little bit earlier tonight, but want to make sure that y'all had time to watch that Pels game because it's critical. We got to support our New Orleans teams, got to support our New Orleans sports. So if you haven't, put it on your TV. Obviously, a little bit late to be there, but appreciate you. Who that? God bless. Thank you, every single one of you, for supporting this channel. Join the Discord if you haven't already. Let me know what you think in the post game. We'll see you next time. Deuces, we're out.